Hello, good evening everyone. Welcome to the Royal Photographic Society and this latest in the series of awards talks. It's been a pleasure to hand over this evening to Joe McDonald, the RPS's awards manager. Joe, over to you. Welcome to tonight's conversation between Jason Bell and Mike Tro. Jason's work has appeared in many of the world's foremost publications, including Vanity Fair and Vogue, UK and US, featuring celebrities such as Angelina Jolie, Leonardo DiCaprio, Daniel Craig and Eddie Redmayne. He has shot numerous film, theatre and TV campaigns and many of his photographs have been acquired by the National Portrait Gallery. Mike Tro began his career as an editor and reportage agent for the major agency Colorific. He was picture editor at British Vogue for 13 years. As a photographer, he has shot for Vogue and other titles. He now works as a curator, consultant, freelance editor and photographer, and has also been a member of the Society's Awards Committee. The conversation will be followed by Q&A. Please put your questions on Zoom chat. The next conversation will be between Kim Cox, who was given the Society's Award for Scientific Imaging in 2021, and Hugh Turvey on F on the 7th of June. Hello, everyone. Um, this is the first time I've ever done anything like this, so it's mildly disturbing and quite exciting. <laughs> I hope you're all OK, and um, I don't mumble too much. Um, it's a pleasure to be here tonight and asked to do this. Um, with Jason. Jason and I have a long relationship going back got 15 years or so and our first shoot was in 2007 for British Vogue of Mary, Mary Gay McKee who was the head buyer for Harrods of course. Um, how Jason and I got in touch I'd seen his work in Vanity Fair and other places and I'd been in Vogue for a couple of years as picture editor and was still finding my feet and uh, Jason and I had a few conversations about getting into the magazine and then Marigay came up and was the first shoot. It was the right one to do for him. Um, his style fitted who she was. It was a good first shoot to do. Quite tricky technically because we were in, in the middle of Harrods with hideous shop lighting and all those issues. But actually um, part of Jason's advantage with these kinds of things is he's technically very good while seeming to not know anything about lighting. He's actually vaguely good at it. So we got together, we got on very well, and started with that. Um, I'd like to hand over for Jason to say a few words from his side of things, but I just want to say we've been friends all that time. Um, I left Vogue four years ago. We've stayed in touch, and Jason's career, as magazines have changed, is moving in new directions and shooting up, which is exciting, and we will get to that later on. But let me hand over to Jason to say hello to you all, first of all. Jason. Hi. Hello, everyone. Thanks for thanks for joining. Um, uh, well, as Mike said, I think uh, my met, first met Mike. I remember our very first meeting was in the pub, um, which I think was a good kind of uh, precursor to our working relationship. Um, one of the things I immediately enjoyed about um, Mike and working with Mike is there's a sort of lightness to his touch and uh, certainly the way I run shoots is I like them to be fun. I think it's very important. Um, when you're photographing someone uh, to, you know, get them to relax into the, the process of being photographed, you know, you're, everybody projects an image of themselves uh, and is nervous about, you know, their image and how they appear in the world. So I think there's a, it's almost a sort of, I mean, I would say a trick to getting people to sort of become less conscious of being photographed. And I found very quickly that Mike and I were, were quite often a sort of double act. He, you know, he would be quite irreverent uh, during shoots. I'm sure that will come across in this conversation. Um, <laughs> and so he would tease me a lot and it would make people giggle. And, you know, obviously I'm, I am, of course, very serious about my work and I'm very serious about photography, but I think often, and I've, you know, uh, had this conversation with other photographers, there becomes a sort of performative element of yourself as you as you take pictures where you are in a way trying to distract the person that you're photographing from the process of being photographed mm. and um, I think that worked quite well with Mike because people often were, were sort of quite amused by this sort of banter going on between me and Mike and uh, he well hopefully I give as good as I get he certainly gives um, and that but you know I think like me Mike is also very serious about photography so the sort of 
the jokiness is, uh, you know, is definitely a, a sort of layer on top of what's going on underneath. Yeah. Um, it, the other thing I like a lot about, you know, my, my sort of favorite clients or favorite people that commission me is that balance between saying what they want, what they need, and then letting me get on with it. And I always find that is, you know, very important to, in a way, of course, my, as a you know, picture editor is acting as a filter between me and the magazine, particularly at the beginning of our working relationship, when he's saying, you know, this is the direction the magazine is going in. This is what they're looking for. This this will go down well. This won't. Um, and then, so um, that's very useful, in, you know, information for me to to provide what what is required. But then also um, to you know let me do it. And I think yeah. you know I think we all find that the, the clients that don't micromanage you are um, you know are to be prized for sure. Well, I mean, part of the issue for me, part of the reason why I was always so reverent on the day and had so much fun is that all the stress actually comes before the shoot. You know, if we, with a Vogue shoot, we'd be planning it two or three weeks or a month in advance, and I would be having to get a makeup team, her team, um, locations. Jason and I always talked about locations a lot. We'd think about what the story needed. So the pressure was on me way before the shoot. And believe me, I got pretty stressed about it. Once you're on set, Nothing should really go wrong if you've done the production correctly. So working with Jason, we talk about the mood board, what the feel was, who the stylist was going to be, what clothes were going to be there. So all these elements are in place. And in theory, nothing should go wrong. So once I'm on set, Jason's lovely. He knows what he's doing. He takes it very seriously. You know, once we have a location, we look at what angles are there. He looks at the clothes, how it's going to work. I mean, just to show you here, one of our biggest shoots was the pole dark shoot, which was, you'll see on the screen later. But, you know, this location we found, we worked very hard for, and the whole, the whole texture was worked seriously through before we got anywhere near being on set. So once I get on set, it is about making sure that the people we're photographing do relax into it, that they know we're not going to get super intense about things, that they are there to be made to look as good as possible. You know, the beautiful thing about Vogue is there is no angle apart from making people look fabulous and beautiful and trying to take perfect pictures. And getting super stressed about it quite often doesn't make that happen. But if you bring a lightness of touch and everyone eases into it and you know it's just a photo and it's a quarter of a second, then you get things that are beautiful and that last Hello. and feel easy. And, we have, and, and if you have a good day doing it, why would you have a bad day? It's a well, I think to that's do it. true as well. There's a, there's a sort of, in, in, from my own point of view, there's almost a selfishness to wanting to have fun on a shoot. You know, I don't think anyone enjoys being horribly stressed, uh, and that you know, atmosphere doesn't doesn't bring out the best in people. I think Mike's point is a good one that you know, every photograph is you know a tenth of a second or you know it's a fraction of a second so frankly you know if someone's sort of laughing or giggling or being silly in between those fractions of seconds it, it doesn't matter because of course that's what the edit is about um and and then you know like i said selfishly you know it's just why not have a fun day and I, I think that's also goes back to you know you're drawn to people that you you know enjoy working with um i think mike's also right that the if I think for both of us, the stress is definitely the probably the location selection beforehand. For me, that was in a way uh, the biggest part of every mm. shoot. And I think there's an irony that me and Mike working for Vogue, I would say for me, the clothes were definitely not the most important element of the shoot, which is, of course, you know, ironic when you're working for a fashion magazine. To me, you know, the person always comes first and then, you know, the, the setting you're putting them in and then the clothes uh, certainly from my point of view, then feed the kind of the story you're telling. So, you know, Mike mentioned Paul Dark, and this is the, the cast there, and it was shot at, it was Chavanich House, isn't it, Mike? Yeah. And, yeah, and so, country. you know, we'd looked at it beforehand, and there was lots of, you know, well, where will we do it? What, what are the, 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 the places there? And then, of course, you know, you go down, and I would get, we'd go early and look and pick, you know, and again, you know, it's, it's rather amazing. This, the place had it. it had its there were lots chapel. of options there as well. It's a big place. So we had the chapel, we had the grounds, we had the inside of the house. So you know that if you're going to do, you know, an eight page story, which you pretty much were, you've got enough options going on. What you never want is too much repetition. You're trying to get a different feel running through it. And a, and a narrative set, particularly with something like this, a pole dark, where, you know, we're not slavishly following the pole dark theme, but we have to relate to it for those commercial reasons. And this shoot worked out really well in that way. 
think there's a balance there as well between, you know, Mike says that you, know, you don't want the pictures to repeat, but you do also want them to hang together as a set of pictures. You know, mm. it's rather odd if you're looking through an eight page story and they're sort of all over the place and, you know, some pictures don't match others. You want them to feel like, you know, this is a set of pictures. And uh, that is partly helped by uh you know the location is hanging them together and then also of course the styling is is hanging them together as a set of pictures so you know there aren't odd ones that jump out uh, but at the same time yeah you're not looking for them to you know repeat the same idea again and again and uh this you know this kind of thing uh comes up a lot you know and another big shoot that i would like to you know uh talk about is for the crown and yeah. that was an interesting one um on a couple of levels from my point of view i had already been asked by netflix to shoot the marketing campaign um, for the crown and oddly quite often that will put a magazine actually put a magazine off um, asking you to do it on the grounds that you know you've been connected with the advertising of the show and the magazine <coughs> you know rightly wants the shoot to be their own and to look and feel different yeah. um, so i think there's an element there where you know, I hope I'm sort of versatile enough as a photographer to shoot in a different way. And again, that very much involves a conversation with Mike about making it a Vogue shoot rather than, you know, a marketing shoot. It, for... Yeah, it's editorial and you have to shoot for the for the magazine you're shooting for in their style. You know, this crown shoot for me was incredibly stressful to do because of dealing with Netflix and dealing with a huge number of cast members and the time and the production, um, who was going to be on set who was hair and makeup with all these things, how the stylists were going to get those clothes there. This was a huge production because although the clothes look like they're part of the set, they're not. These are all fashion pieces specifically chosen for this shoot. So this was a sort of horror where it wasn't as much fun at all to put together, but was great once we actually got on set and did it. And then, you know, Jason's amazing with actors. So then they all go into their roles, which then makes this shoot, you know, it feels editorial, but it also links in very clearly to what the programme is about. And more and more you see that in editorial shoots with actors and um, you know, how magazines work. What do you think, Jerry? I think there's an element, there's an element also that, you know, actors increasingly are being, uh, are doing shoots because they have something to promote or sell. So, yeah. you know, what you end up in this situation, there's always a bit of a battle between, say, you know, Netflix wanting you to very much refer to the show. You know, it's got to be about the crown. We're plugging. We want people to see the crown. And then, you know, the magazine is, is saying, well, you know, we're interested in photographing these people and we want to show these clothes. You know, for us, frankly, the, the crown you know, is kind of the reason we're there, but it's not it's not the thing, that the, the thing that we're trying to promote. So there's there's a tension there, if you like. Um, yeah. That, I mean, I would say can get you into trouble, but I think that's probably not true, you know, because in a, in a sense also, I mean, from my point of view, also one of the great things about working for a magazine like Vogue is usually, you know, uh, people are rather excited to be in it. And that is something that's got much easier throughout my career. You know, when I started, I was working for, you know, tiny little design magazines or supplements or things that people would, you know, they'd have agreed to be photographed, but they, you know, it, in my experience, when you shoot someone for Vogue and Vanity Fair, they kind of bring their A game because they're a yeah. little bit excited about, you know, the, the magazine itself. And, and that's actually quite helpful in terms of, you know, persuading people to do things. Um, I would also say uh, that right. the internet has, has changed things for me there. In, when I started out, obviously, you know, photographers didn't have websites, the internet didn't exist. So very often I would be photographing people who didn't know my work, you know, hadn't seen it. And I find more and more, and this really happened a lot in America, but uh, has started happening, you know, very much in, in Britain as well, that actors would have looked at my website and would know. And, you know, often the conversation would start with, oh, I really like that picture you did of so-and-so, which, for me, I mean, it sounds like an ego thing, but it's actually that's not what's interesting or useful about it. What's good is, in a way, the actor arrives warmed up because they've already they've already seen your work, they know where you're coming from, and they like it. You know, it's even better. Well, they already like have that level of don't. trust that you don't have to build right. in the first two hours. You know, originally when you do a shoot, people turn up, they wouldn't know your work, but we set it up, and then we do some Polaroids, and then you have a chat, and you show them a Polaroid, and go through this whole process of creating a trust where they understand that what you're doing is actually is great. And so by having, you know, the internet and everyone's websites and they're seeing the work, they already come confident. You know, there's nothing worse. And I, I've done it where I produce shoots with a new photographer 
and it's been pretty disastrous and everyone's known that this is kind of sucky and then it's a problem for me to make it work but now well, we we joke as well that yeah. you know, and back in those days you you very careful about showing the first polaroid and yeah know, quite often you're taking pictures and you're like oh, it's not good enough net not yeah. good enough yet you're sort of hiding the polaroids until exactly. you get something you like this isn't my work yeah 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 i think that's so, right to get to get people on board it's uh, it's in a way it's much easier but then also expectation is so high now as well because of that so it's a double-edged sword in a way people well, say, that's, you know, that's a good point look, actually you know, there is a case, I want, the, that shot you did was great. I want to look like that. Well, if you don't look like that, you're never going to look like that. And people's perceptions of themselves and, you know, actors and musicians in particular, actually, are quite tricky about how they think they actually are in reality. I think that's right, because then there's a pressure for them as well. That, that You know, I said before, um, you know, they'll bring their A-game and they're excited to be in vogue, but the, the, you're right, the double-edged sword there is also, oh, but I'm going to be, in, you know, I'm in vogue, everyone's going to see this picture. Yeah. So then there's just... We have we ever had tears on set? No. Okay, that's good. I have it on other shoots, but obviously never on a mic. No, it's none with me. I wouldn't allow that. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> it's you just. Not, I'm not going to go there. You're crying about it. Then you got a problem. Oh, no, no, that's good. Uh, Ruth was fun. She was very. She yeah, was very Ruth good. Wilson really was the first person I actually photographed for Vogue myself before she was well known. Oh, so, really? Yeah, okay. yeah. Right. I mean, I, you know, I did a shoot for literally 10 quid, you know, 15 quid for Vogue in a theatre down in, in Borough, and it was a pretty, you know, an hour and a gloomy evening, and they look quite cool, but what she's become now, and then, you know, Jason doing her, at this point, at Claridge's, you know, ten, eight years later after yes. I shot her, she was, yeah. you know, Stella, but still the same person, you know, fun, clever, waspish. She's the sort of actress who's good to do a good shoot with because she's so vile to you. She can be really yeah. funny, really rude, and you get great work out of her, and she switches on immediately. So these are the sorts of shoots where we did have a lot of fun. But again, the production, yeah. getting you know, getting um, where was it? The Connaught sorted out. Yeah. All the production yeah. Yeah. on this, all the hair and makeup, all the styling. Again, this was two weeks to make it right. And these actresses, as they get bigger, are far more self-aware and much more savvy. So you do well, we should bring your game to it as well. Yes, this 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 is a very good example of that. This, this was uh, for the first ever. This is before the films, the first ever series of Downton Abbey, and yeah. um, I think Michelle Dockery probably had done a couple of shoots, but not many, and was certainly not famous. But Jessica Brown Finley on the left there, um, it was definitely her first ever shoot, and I remember her saying to me as we were prepping. I'm, I'm just so excited to be in Vogue, you know, and I nearly peed my pants. And that was, that was just hilarious because I've, that this, this programme particularly, I've worked on many, many times since. I then shot the cast again for Vanity Fair. Um, I shot them again, I think, for British Vogue. Then I shot the poster for the first film. I've just shot the campaign for the second film. So these are, you know, people I've been working yeah, with years. Huge. And, you know, Hugh Bonneville will always kind of giggle and go, oh, you again. Um, but you know, you you see, you do, you see the transition of these people as you mm. know, Jessica Brown Finley is, is a well-known actress now. Michelle Dockery's career is, you know, is enormous. Um, and of course, at this point, you know, they're they're starting out. And that's that's lovely. I mean, there's a there's a joke that Peter Lindbergh made, which I always really liked when he was doing the Hollywood portfolio, uh, the uh, what was it? The, no, not, not the Hollywood portfolio, the Pirelli calendar. Okay, he did yeah. it all with um unheard of actresses and he muttered in one of the interviews you know give it two years and they'll all be moaning about the size of their limo which i think is it's funny but and you know of course possibly unfair because you know there's many people who um go on to have these huge careers and remain lovely mm. and obviously there are a few who don't um but i think that it's true that you know we me and mike will notice you know when you work with people again and again you know watching them change if you like as their mm. star rises i mean this first shoot with them looks absolutely fabulous we did it in kew gardens it was a job to get hold of the greenhouse um i had a just a, a truck with a, a space in the back for hair and makeup one of you know basically one big um location vehicle and that was it i'm buying coffins for people it looks like we spent a million dollars on it actually it was a pretty low budget just believe it or not for editorial even for british vogue there were big budgets you know i couldn't have treated these people like stars because we didn't have the money to do it but when they're fresh and young and know what we're doing and trust what we're going to do then it's like, you know, when they're doing a small budget film, they know what it is to be a bit chilly 
but to get a result out of it. And that's what was so fun about this, this first one with them. They were really fun. We laughed. I used to see them out in Soho straight after, always go for a drink with them. They loved it. So those sorts of results are good. You know, I've never liked it when someone comes in and six months later, oh, I didn't like that picture of me you ran. Oh, I look shit. Or, you know, we well, could have told me at the time, or you saw what we were doing. If you didn't like it, say so. Um, but we never had that with the Downton girls. And they've got bigger and bigger, but they're still pretty fun. The thing I think, you know, I, I would um, inject there as well is, for me, photographing people is collaborative, you know, and I, I like to say mm. to the people I'm photographing, I can't do it on my own, you know, my job, in a way, I think that's more the job of a sort of a paparazzi to photograph someone with no involvement in their part, like you're spying on them. Um, whereas for me, you know, even back in the day when, you know, we showed people Polaroids or, you know, now, of course, we, you know, we show them a monitor, we show them the screen. If you like, that aspect of, of my work definitely has got even more exaggerated with the advent of digital because people really can see what you're doing all the time, you know, and it, it's quite hard uh, to say to someone, you know, I don't want you to see the screen. It was always much easier as a film photographer to, you know, load the film and do it. And, you know, you, you sort of you got them to trust you, but they didn't necessarily know what you were doing. Um, and so I think in that respect, that's that's worked well for me to be a collaborative photographer. You know, you show someone you want them to get excited about the image and you yeah, I will say, you know, look, I'm not doing this on my own. We're going on a journey and you, know, you do it with me. And uh, Olivia Coleman, again, is a good example of that. You know, she was she was definitely not the, the sort of household name that she is now. Her career is absolutely stellar now. Yeah. And this was her first appearance in Vogue, and she was just so lovely. And I remember her saying, and "Quite shy you know, about it." She was shy, anxious, wasn't and she, she was quite anxious about it. And she wanted to, she wanted to please us. Yes, um, I remember that quite a lot. I remember her saying, was, "Oh, thank you for my big debut in Vogue. You know, I, thank you for making me feel like a Vogue woman." Which was, you know, that's a really sort of lovely, a lovely gift if you like to give someone. You and know, we made I her think, look like one. I mean, we, you know, we really worked it very well to bring something out of her that hadn't been seen before. You know, she was always a sort of character actor, not a great beauty, but there's something about what we did with her and the time we spent. She plays the every woman a lot. Yeah, actually. and we you know, kind, so of, it's it's kind of, sort yeah. of transformative for her, actually. And, um, and she was such fun and really funny, but very, you know, quite shy and quite nervous about doing it and wanted to please yeah. us and yeah. feel good enough to do it. And that was on a Sunday. You know, we all went down to the, a place down near Greenwich, um, there at seven in the morning, done by it was one. a shipmaster's house or something, yeah. isn't it called? Yeah, yeah. Master yeah. Shipwrights. Right. Mm -hmm. A fabulous location. That's right. Yeah. Um, so. Then, then uh, this is Felicity Jones, and again, she I thought she had much more of a sort of presence to her. She, was all, she wasn't, you know, a well-known actress at this point, but she was definitely in a different place to Olivia Coleman, where, she, I don't know, maybe, you know, more secure about her appearance or something, but she felt very like she, you know, belonged oh. in this world in a, in, in a way. No, I mean, um, you know, you see all the locations we're using as we're going through these. Everyone fits into the location perfectly. Um, and the oh, well, colour... I'm glad you said that, because this, so well. this is, this is um, Sarah Burton from Alexander McQueen, and an incredibly sort of down-to-earth person. And I remember... Didn't we have a conversation with her beforehand about where are we going to do it? And I yeah. think Mike said to her, well, you know, what do you do in your spare time when you're not, you know, running Alexander McQueen? And she was like, well, I'm down the pub. And I definitely remember a conversation with Mike going, well, that's absolutely where we should do her. And the pint of Guinness on the table at the model's foot was, was Sarah's idea. And I remember her saying, because we were like, well, you know, you should have a drink. You should have a drink. What do you drink? Yeah. And again, you know, to the point I made before, I think that is about, allowing you know the person you're photographing to be part of the process not to say well here is my idea and this is the idea that i am imposing on you and this is how we will do it um so which I is like the key with fashion photography actually fashion is very much about a, a story that the model has to fit into with these portraits everyone has to bring something of themselves because that's what we want to see so you have to get a sense of character sarah isn't a serious person you know she is serious but that smile is real. She's having yeah, fun. Yeah. The model is doing what the model does. She's there for the dress and it's fabulous. And by putting on the table, we've really lengthened the whole picture and made this sort of um, rather extreme version of the super tall model. So that image is fun because you have the lightness of 
Sarah, and you know, she's designing these amazing dresses that are 50,000 pounds. She has a team that's really intense her world, but underneath she's a great working mother who likes to find a Guinness and she makes it. So everything about this image kind of captures the world of McQueen as she was taking it over. You know, when Alexander died, it was pretty stressful for her, but she carried on that torch um, with a certain joy, I think. And she was really fun, to, again, fun to be with and not at all showy or princessy. She does what she does and you get that sense over. I think there's definitely something as well in the edit of this picture. You know, there's a very conscious decision to, you know, go with a frame that has her smiling. Uh, and I, I, to me, I think when I, did, when I edit the pictures, I'm thinking about the smile says to me, I'm in on the joke. You know, I get the, the whole, you know, here is a McQueen dress in an East End pub and me with a pint of Guinness. And again, that's the sort of, that's her bringing something to it that I want to include. Yeah, and then also remember this goes to the editor of the magazine. So, you know, I would show an edit to Alex with my opinions of you know, what Jason's favorites are, what my favorites are. Um, you know, you see, I would then have to show it in front of 30 people and to, to get a yes or a no in a rather sort of Caesar like way. So, this went down really well straight away, which is quite, you know, depending on the mood, you never knew what you were going to get. Um, but it was always quite nerve wracking for me to do these shoots and then have to take them into the Vogue team and show them to the whole team and then get a sort of approval and then run. But during the time, we never worried about that. This is... No, I suppose that's true. Yeah. <laughs> that's kind of your problem, isn't it? Yeah, it was really my problem. You didn't give a shit. <laughs> <laughs> go on, Mike, go and sell it to them. Um, I feel sad, well, obviously very sad this <clears throat> about this shoot because of Helen, um, Helen McCrory dying. But um, she was so lovely on the day. And again, you know, I, I, I wanted to include this one because I think particularly in, you know, my work with Mike, there's the fantasy or the expectation that everything is terribly glamorous. Uh, and, you know, we are doing a Vogue shoot and there's all these Vogue, you know, amazing clothes. And I think people who don't, are not necessarily intimately connected with the sort of the magazine business have this expectation that you know it's glamour 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 and of course you know the reality is it's absolutely that. freezing that day and i yep. remember helen's teeth like chattering we did another picture actually on i think it was westminster bridge and she you know it's an off the shoulder dress and she's she really her teeth are chattering like crazy and that's obviously not that glamorous and um I'm, you know, I'm very conscious of this, knowing that I'm putting her in this position and that, you know, she's uncomfortable. And uh, I say, you know, I'm, I'm so sorry, you're right. She goes, no, 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 let's just get it done. It's Vogue, darling. Yeah. And uh, I'd like, you know, that sense of humour and, you know, willingness to, uh, you know, to be uncomfortable and, you know, to get the picture is, of course, you know, absolutely priceless to me as the, as the photographer. Yeah, I mean, I'd hired the um, National Theatre for this on the South Bank. And of course with Vogue, you know, we're shooting three months in advance. So this had to look kind of sort of late spring, but it was basically winter pretty much, wasn't it? I think when we did yeah, it. Yeah, so, I mean, that is always the fashion problem, yeah. isn't it? You're yeah, never shooting so you're always season, shooting you're freezing in. for when it's going yeah. to be hot. So, but those two, they're fun the to go. Thing, I think to, to, you know, to touch on something Mike said, is, which is true is, um, Fashion models, you know, they do what they're told. They're not expected to have an opinion about the picture. Um, so he is like, put the clothes on, stand mm. there. And that's very different. And in that respect, you know, I definitely don't consider myself a fashion photographer. I'm a portrait photographer. And I'm often working, you know, particularly now. I mean, I, I get called a celebrity photographer, which makes me laugh because it's not that I'm particularly... Um, obsessed by fame uh, it, it, it's just true that you know a lot of the people that i photograph now are very very famous and of course the more you photograph famous people the more you get asked to photograph famous people but you know essentially i'm a portrait photographer but as a portrait photographer rather than a fashion photographer you know there is that thing of the people i'm photographing have opinions and i want them to have yeah. opinions you know back to my earlier point about you know i collaborate with them so it isn't the same as me saying to a model just stand there and, and do what you're told. And I don't denigrate that. It's just not, it isn't, you know, my process, if you like. And yeah, so I mean, when you're doing a portrait, that person isn't being paid. They're there, you know, for a number of reasons, but ultimately you have to have a relationship with them. Otherwise they can walk off if they're not treated right. 
they will walk away. Then you yeah. won't get something that's good. I've had, you know, I did have a shoot actually for another magazine after I left Vogue, where the shoe went so badly that the subject went and hid in the toilet. It was in New York. And there was, was a woman who was a daughter of a very famous senator, was hiding in the toilet with her assistant ringing me, going, the owners of this house are psychopaths. So that was a disastrous shoot. So I can say with Jason, we never had that, ever, okay. regardless of the weather the situations. But when it goes wrong, it goes really wrong. <laughs> We've had some difficult people. Um, yeah. But no, people. no, definitely never had that. This is an unusual one as well for us together because, you know, we very rarely worked in the studio. Almost everything was on location. And, uh, and we had the only black the, and white. We weren't allowed to, were we? I always wanted to, but it was, again, you know, to Mike's point about, you know, um, having to sell it back to the magazine, the magazine would always be like, no, 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 we want the They wanted your brown toning. Oh, no, okay. so <laughs> talk about that. So, uh, well, there's a serious point there and a joke point. The joke point was that, you know, Mike used to give me a hard time and say, you know, you're, you're toning these pictures too heavily. Uh, it doesn't go down well at the magazine. And... I think once the magazine, particularly the editor, Alexandra, had decided that, you know, all Jason's pictures are brown. Yeah. And I literally so, that would be said to me. <laughs> and I would, and, and, when the editor came in, I would change them to brighter colours before I showed them. Then, like, and she would still say they were brown. <laughs> he would do a little bit of a retouch behind my back, not telling me, change them. <laughs> and then she was obviously so obsessed by the fact that Jason's pictures were brown by this point that she would... Uh, uh, think they were brown anyway, even if yeah. Mike had corrected them or I hadn't put a style on them at all. But the, behind that joke, I think, you know, obviously at the time I sort of thought about it and, you know, I kept toning these pictures and Mike would ring me and go, you can't help yourself. What's the matter with you? But it's the same reason back in the day I never used um, straight transparency film. And I think it, when I sort of thought about that, you know, intellectually, I, I don't, I'm not really a big fan of pictures that are too real. In other words, mm. Uh, and I've had this said to me before when, I, when I'm traveling, people go, you know, it's odd, you don't really take travel pictures. I'm not really interested. And again, it's, I, I don't denigrate them. It's just not my area of sort of artistic interest. I'm not really interested in recording things. I'm interested in creating something. And, you know, I, I often think if I, if I wasn't so impatient and I had more time, I would have been a portrait painter. You know, if photography hadn't been invented, I would have painted people's pictures. That's, that's really what my sort of process or what I'm interested in, interested in, you know, making a picture. And that, as Mike said, you know, the hair, the makeup, the clothes, the location, you know, all these elements, how you light it. Um, and so in a way, I think, you know, that's not using straight transparency or, or no tone to the pictures or very flat feels a bit to me like just sort of recording what's in front of you rather than making something. And I'm sure that's where I got very into this sort of toning pictures. Uh, and I think also- making ident It's making identity. You know, photographers do have to have something that makes them recognizable. And you yeah. came up with something very elegant and warm um, and human and quite timeless that had a sort of a certain tone to it. It's not, you know, the whole thing about being overtoned, they, they never really were but they have a richness to them that became your sort of, you know, trademark, which is why you got so much Vanity Fair work. You know, if you look at Vanity Fair right through Annie, through to you, to the other photographers, they all have a very distinct style. And, and for you to come into Vogue and, and bring that to it was, was really good. And this black and white here even feels quite painterly, the way you, you know, retouched and shot it. It's, it's you know, they're lovely. Yeah, there's, it's not real in the sense that you can see that. I don't know if you can see my cursor moving here, but I'm showing yeah. you that, you know, the vignette around it is, you know, takes it away, I suppose, from being just a straight record. There's a, that kind of the chiaroscuro of it. It makes mm. it less less real, I suppose, in some way. Um, and that definitely appeals to me. Now, that's a challenging one because, of course, there's always something interesting about photographing another photographer. And uh, I remember he absolutely delightful and also interestingly for me was one of my heroes when I was starting out I really those early the 60s uh, Bailey black and white portraits were just absolutely breathtaking to me uh, I think in a way because of the economy of them how much he could say with so little you know they seemed so simple here's a white background picture of Michael Caine with a cigarette hanging out of his mouth it's such an iconic picture but it doesn't you know there's not a flashy lighting trick or a you know a complicated set it's a very very simple picture that's incredibly powerful so funnily enough I you know 
uh, you know, people ask me, do I get nervous photographing, you know, Halle Berry or the Queen or, you know, some of the, you know, very well-known people I, I get to photograph. And I find not in that situation, but there was definitely a sort of nerve for me in photographing Bailey. And I, you know, maybe I wanted his approval in some way. And he was so charming and but suspicious looking which i think is again why i picked that picture well, he is he's very direct as well and if he's not happy he'll let you know straight away you know he well, might work with him a lot actually you know yeah he, he, he's, he's so. i've known him for a long time and, and fun and i did all the vote shoots with him but believe me if if, if he wasn't happy you knew immediately so yeah for so any photographer did... to photograph bailey is a tricky gig we did we, and we did seven frames i remember it very clearly we did seven frames and he looked at me and i looked at him and i, I thought i know what he's going to say and he went we've got it haven't we and i thought yeah we have actually and i should trust him because he knows what he's doing and I, hopefully i know what i'm doing so it was seven frames and then it was really lovely i still remember it to this day he came over to the monitor so this is uh, digital is probably quite new at this point or well, i was quite late to digital and uh, he comes over to the monitor puts his arm around me and we're looking at the monitors together and he looked at this picture and I looked at it and we looked at each other and he went, that's the one, isn't it? And we said, yes. And I thought, banging, you know, it's been signed <laughs> off by the man himself here and now. I just, I love that. And so I have a very, a very fond memory of, of that one. Uh, and then this in the same session. And this was the absolute opposite of the Bailey experience where yeah. it was kind of a nightmare where he just walked in and he said, perfectly nice guy, very charming. That wasn't the issue, but the issue was just <clears throat> so incredibly controlling. He said, uh, I want you to move that light there. You know, I don't want that light as high as it is. And in my head, I'm sort of thinking, oh God, okay, you know, and I'll sit, you know, I won't stand. I'll only do this, I'll only do that. Yeah, he always has a side light. Oh. Um, sorry, can you hear me? Yeah, we went. We went okay. Um, it, it sort of, yeah, he's 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 running the show, and I think that's that's very much the opposite of what I was saying before about it. You know, it being a collaboration, and it's not again an ego thing for me that you know I have to be in charge and how dare you question me. But it is a bit, you know, if you won't let me do my thing and you're saying, well, you know, it has to be like this or that, then I think, you know, it it isn't it isn't the creative process that i'm after and he then went on stage just after that and alex was interviewing and i think he could see me in the in the balcony at the festival looking up and he said oh yeah you know i tortured your poor photographer <laughs> so, well, yeah I mean, he really did i think the thing with tom is he knows his eyes are quite close together so he's always photographed at an angle to make sure they're always a bit further apart than they are Okay. Uh, I, I did a couple you of should have told me that before. Well, you know, it was all happening quite quickly. <laughs> but he, he, he lovely and charming, but absolutely in control of his image in every way. I got I got Bailey to photograph him once, and then he photographed Bailey for me and turned Bailey into like a Tom Ford model in a silk dressing gown. It was the weirdest experience you've ever seen. Oh, I'd quite like to look so you did pretty well all all <laughs> overall with that <laughs> one. Well, I, you know, I sometimes say definitely a part of my job. I've said this before is to in a way not freak out um i remember doing a shoot we, we, we should come on to that on the way of the time but uh doing a shoot on the man of steel movie with with henry cavill and you know there were a lot of a lot of um uh a lot of famous actors on set um a lot of actually i wonder if i can probably just show you the picture i have to find it but um a, a lot of famous actors on set a lot of publicists a lot of um you know things happening and um I said to one of my assistants, can you just count the number of people in the room? And uh, they came back. Yeah, here's one of the pictures. And they came back and uh, there were 120 people in the room. <laughs> and I remember, and they're all standing there and, you know, there's monitors all over the place and they're all looking and they're like, you know, you, you are the captain of the ship, obviously. And they're sort of saying, you know, do this, you know, what, what do we do? What do we do? Run the show. And uh, I remember at that moment sort of thinking, well, you know, and it's a thing Mike said before, if you've done your homework and you've done your prep and you've really you know, planned the shoot properly, you shouldn't be freaking out on the day because you're ready and your lights are up and you've built the set, you know, whatever it is. But um, you're, yeah, I think in that moment, you know, your job in a way is to just not freak out. And I think yeah, that's, big group that's probably like true. That. Uh, big group <laughs> shots can be scary. If you have a good idea where you roughly draw out where you're going to put people, but then you have the whole world of political issues between all of them, Who's the most powerful person there? Where do they sit in their own hierarchies? Where do they think they sit in the hierarchy? Where does their publicist think they sit in the hierarchy? 
group shots like this are an absolute horror to put together sometimes. Don't you think? I mean, yeah, I think it's more, you know, it's more in the planning <clears throat> and less in the, you know, what, what happens less is uh, like, in, you know, in this one, I can't, I can speak to them all individually, but it has to be quick because there's so many of them. And I can't really bond with Hugh Bonneville, you know, in this situation, in the way that I would normally. I'd normally say, <clears throat> you know, look at this picture, you know, and we, we do it together. There, there just isn't time and there's too many people. And, you know, there's a slightly uncomfortable thing that you're sort of having to shout, you know, a bit like an old fashioned director with a, you know, improvised megaphone or something, you, because you've got them, you've, they've got to all hear you. Mm. And that is, it changes the dynamic. You know, it's yeah. definitely less intimate, um, and you know you have to be aware of that. But it's uh, it's a different skill, I suppose. In in you know to my point before, I think it it brings out in a way even more the sort of the painterly aspect of my job. Because you know this picture particularly, you know I've really thought about this light here, and actually, funnily enough, this this is the playwright. Uh, I shot him in New York, so he's not actually in the room, but everybody else is there in camera. But, you know, these things, as they're, as they're planned down, this light washing over here and this light washing over here, is very much building a painting beforehand. And I think in that respect, you know, it's a different uh, discipline to the, the sort of one-on-one -on -one sessions that, um, you know, we've obviously done lots of as well. Um, and then one other group I should probably just mention as we go, because that was something that's quite uh, oh. group. And again, <laughs> uh, there's a uh, christening of Prince George. And I think in that one, you know, I, I mentioned before, you know, not, not freaking out. I think a lot of people were like, you know, were you incredibly nervous? I remember going to the um, to Clarence house and the housekeeper saying she'd, she'd let somebody into the house and they had uh, fainted. They were so nervous. And I kind of laughed and said, you know, no, I, I, I won't be fainting. That won't be happening. But again, you know, it, I think that's that's true. A big thing there for me is to, you know, keep it together. And uh, the argument, you know, the, the process there is very much be prepared. So I've, I've made it look like, uh, I mean, it's a christening, obviously, so it's a sort of fun, happy picture. So I've made it look like lovely, warm afternoon light. It was kind of my idea for the shoot is coming into the room. And of course, it's actually October in London, and I'm thinking, well, we can't rely on that. So this is all actually flash, or, or loads and loads of flash heads running off a generator out in the street, coming through the window. And that is, in a way, my way of relaxing into it, because I know it doesn't really matter what the weather does. I've, I've lit it. I know how it looks. I know how it feels. And so, you know, now we can just, you know, be in the moment. Yeah. And I think that kind of makes it easier. Um, so we were going to, Mike, Mike, we were then just going to talk about things changing, I suppose, weren't we? And I, we should just touch on that. Yeah, I, just, I mean, just touch, because I mean, for both of us, things have changed a lot, because I walked out of Vogue, I left Vogue um, a few years ago. Did you walk out? You, you, I walked you, out with my head held high and a feather in my hat. <laughs> no, I, I kind of thought I'd done it for 13 years and it was time to start doing something else. So I managed to sort of find my way out of there when the, the big change came because, um, you know, lots of reasons, but I kind of had done my time, I've been similar stuff. And I also felt that the level of um, trust and integrity was kind of changing in the magazine world. Um, and now, you know, magazines, having left Vogue, and it was kind of perfect the time I worked on it with Alex Filman at the helm. She was a difficult woman. But I, I left to find, you know, start doing other things, which I've done very slowly, by the way. But for all of us, it's quite interesting how magazines don't take the place in our world that they used to. I went and interviewed students a month ago in, uh, at uh, Anglia University in Cambridge. I asked them who reads magazines, and one of them put their hands up. And yes, so, I, I've got a friend in New, in New York who worked for Vanity Fair. She said she went to her hairdresser and, and said, and he said, oh, what do you do for a living? And, you know, she's a picture editor of Vanity Fair. And, and uh, he said, I, I don't think I've ever, I've ever looked at yeah. that magazine. And, you know, we, me and Mike talk about this a lot. That, you know, the writing is on the wall. I, mean, I had a, one thing I was saying to Mike before, which I think is true, is it, back in the day, uh, before the internet, magazines were the gatekeeper. So in other words, mm. for me, if I wanted anyone to see my work, I had to, you know, apart from that, that I actually love magazines and, you know, always felt very drawn to them. Um, I had to 
work for a magazine because that was the only way to show your work. Well, now, of course, you know, we all have websites and we have Instagram feeds. So we don't need the magazine in the same way to share our work with the world. And so I think yeah. that the reason, urgency has changed. And also the speed of the amount of people just shooting. People want new material all the time. I was listening today about the fact that the old BA advert, you know, with the music and the, the flags and thousands of stuff, that actually played for 10 years for British Airways. Can you imagine any advert now being shown for more than right. six months? That's and the same with yeah. magazines and photographs. These things, at the moment, we don't feel things are meant to last unless they're in the art basis. So art photography has exploded. There are lots more exhibitions and self-expression and those things going on. Reportage has changed, and we see some of it in the press, but not masses. It's all on websites. And for you, Jason, your work has changed, and you've found a, a great niche in streaming the TV streaming giants, which I in a way has replaced a... for you some of the magazine coverage you used to do as far as shooting a lot. I mean, it's funny, it's not something that I did deliberately. I definitely didn't sort of set out to be an entertainment photographer, but I think what happened was, you know, I mean, it's interesting to me that, you know, here's Benedict Cumberbatch and this film is obviously out at the moment. But of course, you know, the, the, the first few times that I shot Benedict were, were for magazines. Um, and uh, I think, with, yeah, I mean, I shot him for the cover of Vanity Fair back in the day. And so, you know, I sort of got to know him a bit. And, you know, we, this is a whole shoot that we did. Well, he was Fair and handsome. <laughs> very, <laughs> he's a good looking chap. Um, and it was very editorial. And I think, uh, so it, maybe there's an obvious progression that, you know, if you work with a lot of actors, then it makes sense that, you know, entertainment becomes, you know, uh, more of the, the thing you do. But it's and certainly, all, you know, all my recent shoots with Benedict have been, have been you know, much more in, in this vein. And then I think maybe the crossover was already there. You know, we, we talked about The Crown. Mm. Um, and of course, you know, I'd, I'd worked on The Crown and that's that's here somewhere. And so, the, you know, the, the, I'm shooting The Crown cast for magazines, but of course I'm also shooting, you know, the poster for Netflix. And so more and more, and again, you know, I mean, I mentioned before that I think um, the more you do a kind of work, the more you get asked to do it. And of course, you know, there are some things beyond your control, like, um, you know, you might, I might do a lovely shoot for a TV show that no one actually sees. And so, it doesn't really register, but, you know, for, you know, reasons you know, a bit beyond my control, The Crown was obviously, you know, Netflix is, you know, a very, very big show for a streamer that was emerging into the world. Um, that was, this is the first campaign here. I and that, yeah. I think, you know, it was a big hit for Netflix. So then they asked me to do more. And likewise, you know, Downton Abbey was, was, it was a show I'd worked on. And then they asked me to do the poster for the film and that becomes a very big film. And so, people see those and say, you know, you get asked to do more of that stuff. But, you know, in a way, I'd always been doing it. This is, you know, one of the first sort of film posters I ever did was, you know, and that was years ago and I was still very much a magazine photographer. So I think, you know, I get asked a lot, you know, well, why did you do this? Why did you do that? And, you know, the, the probably slightly more honest answer often is, well, you know, because I was asked to do it or because that kind of work came to me. Um, but it's definitely... I find it suits me now, this work, because it, it feels more in the vein of, you know, making a picture. And I talked about sort of almost yeah. like portrait painting or creating things before. Uh, these feel very, you know, that this is a show that didn't do very well. So, you know, kind of a good job. I didn't base my career on that, but, you know, I still enjoyed it and I kind of like the picture and it's, it's not a very real looking picture. And then there's pictures like, this, which, you know, I, I remember, I, was, I mean, I live half the time in New York, but I remember coming back and, you know, that was on every bus everywhere in London. And that's, you know, again, not in my control at all, but it was sort of funny to see uh, um, there it was all over the place. Cool. Well, we we're running out of time, so we should probably see if people want to throw some questions at us. Um, as it's 10 to 7 already, our rambling has gone on. So, yeah. I'll let uh, 
that happened. Michael, right. Yeah, thanks. Thanks so much, um, Jason and Mike. I mean, that's such an insight into to your world, which is uh, yeah, so different to I'm sure most of our audiences. Um, I've got some questions already, and if anyone in the audience has got a question or two, please drop them into chat, and we'll come to them. Um, but one of the questions that's come through to me already is um, for Jason this time. Uh, do you do you have any do you do personal work with no commercial outcome? Uh, okay, I love that question because it's been, <laughs> been it, well, it's been on my mind so much. And you know, the honest answer, which you know I'm you're a bit ashamed of, is is no, I haven't done that much. And I think that's just because you know I've been so busy. I also think that there's a sort of younger man. You know, this is interesting and changing for me as I get older. There's a younger man's thing of wanting to be successful and you know do the stuff that seems you know and, and, you know as I get older and hopefully a bit calmer. Um, I think that's, you know, that I feel a bit less ambitious and a bit more like I don't need, you know, other people's opinions. And I think that's definitely opened up a space for me to go, OK, what do I want to do? And I think also it's tied in with what me and Mike are talking about, that magazines were a big creative outlet for me. And as they're, you know, less part of my work, I'm sort of, you know, again, if I'm honest, the, a lot of this, this commercial work, I, you know, sometimes I'm literally given a sketch and told to take that picture. I mean, there's sort of there's some more extreme examples of that than others. But um, there's a good one here. That, for instance, you know, those are very much things I was told to shoot. You know, and OK, it becomes my decision. You know, I want to light it like that, have it feel like that. But, you know, I can't hand on heart say that's my idea in a way that I could with magazines. You know, me and Mike would say, let's, let's photograph them there and let's do it like this. And, you know, they'll be jumping off a bridge or something. So um, I think now is a great moment for me to start doing more personal work because I, I want that release again um and funnily enough the thing i really want to photograph now is flowers so i'm gonna take some time out and photograph and do still lives of flowers and it's almost like a bit of a joke for me because i remember in lockdown i i totally took a sabbatical you know and i didn't pick up a camera for five months and i just I thought, remember I so we, we met for a drink when halfway through that and you said it was right. so bizarre not to have done any work at all but it was good you seemed pretty happy about it i just thought i don't want to photograph empty london streets like every other photographer is doing you know i wasn't interested in empty london streets beforehand and i joked and i said oh i don't really want to photograph flowers either you know i've never photographed flowers before and i think almost in making that joke I've sort of I've been looking at loads of flower pictures recently and thinking, oh, that works. That's nice. You know, I don't want to copy any of them, but I'm really interested. So let's hope I actually do it. I haven't done it yet, so, <laughs> but I've put it out there in the world. So hopefully, I will now take some beautiful pictures of flowers, and I, you know, would like that to be my personal work. There's a long tradition there. I'm thinking people like Robert Mapplethorpe producing gloriously beautiful work of uh, lilies and flowers. So you'll, you'll, you'll be treading in good footsteps if you do go down that road. Um, another question, in fact, this is perhaps for both of you. Um, and Jason, I think it was, you touched briefly about the number of people involved on a set. And this is quite a practical question. Um, it's how big are the teams that you work with on a typical Vogue shoot? I mean, the portrait shoots are not as big as a fashion shoot because you haven't got so many is going on but um jason would have two assistants depending if i was doing groups i'd have two hair two makeup stylist with assistant um then I, we may have another general assistant there as well you might have publicists there uh, it was never nice working with more than 10 or 15 people it gets too much then no, the other thing Normally, if, is if it's someone really famous, yeah. there's inevitably loads of people there who don't need to be there. And you're a bit like, wait, yeah. why are you here? And it's, you know, because they want to meet Halle Berry or something. I so remember suddenly shooting... everybody turns up. Yeah. I did John Legend years ago in a small piano bar in Kensington. He came with 15 people. Yeah, right. I've you know, that. it's a nightmare. So, you know, but it, if you've just got people who need to be there, which is hopefully not more than 10, and they can all step back and get on with it. Then once they've done their gig, you know, once I've told them, you know, what we're doing, how it's going to go, you control it. Then everyone eases back and you don't notice it too much. It's generally if you have a, you're doing a group shot and you have a herd of publicists and they're assisting. That's, a, that's a good point, actually. You, you know, I let, I let 
hair and makeup and style. Do their thing. All those people do their thing. And, and then, you know, it's a respect, a professional respect. Yeah. They're, you know, they're good at their job and hopefully they think I'm good at mine. And, you know, so it's, you anyone who's on a road shoot is good at what they do. Otherwise, they wouldn't be there. Right. But so, then you, you say, know. okay, my turn now, stand back, you know, yeah. and I, I encourage, you know, but hair particularly, actually, I encourage them to like, look, hang around and, it, you know, if it needs tweaking or, you know, especially if you've got you know, wind going and things, you know, I, I want them to be involved. But at the same time, everybody needs to retreat a little bit to get to that moment that I talked about before, where there is, you know, this connection between me and the person being photographed. And I think Mike is right that, you know, you'll get some, I photographed Eminem once and again you know he turned up with I don't know 10 15 people or his mates and you know they're all there distracting him and it's very hard much harder for me to say to his friends or his entourage hey can you back off and, and give us a moment than it is to say you know to you know effectively my Vogue colleagues so um but you know that's all part of the the yeah. things that we never like you can make I mean, a shoot with three people you know if, if it's the right people the stylist one hair and makeup photographer assistant and you you know oh, I did. it's funny uh, you mentioned john legend because i did a picture of him and, and his wife chrissy in there they, they happened to know a friend of mine and they said we need to have a picture and we had no hair no makeup no style yeah. it was four of us in the room that was lucky was quite funny. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um so we've got a question from um alexander in our audience uh, asking do you consider yourself as having a particular style if so what do you think has been the most influential to the development of that style uh, yes i would say my style is you know quite classic quite be you know be i like beauty i like beautiful images classic images i don't you know there's things i'm not crazy about like you know on camera flash uh the kind of the terry richardson way of doing things and don't get me wrong you know i've seen some brilliant terry richardson pictures and you, you know some uh so it's not that you know like it, it's just not me uh, there's mm. a sort of rawness to it that i'm not not that i'm not after um I don't know. I mean, I think everybody should be allowed to change their style. So I, I hope I'm not locked into something forever. But I mean, I have always, I, I said before, I, I'm not crazy about pictures that are too real. I think that's why I was never a reportage photographer or a photojournalist, um, because it, the interest for me, and again, I don't denigrate those fields at all. They're just, it's not my aim to, to record things. I'm more interested in, you know, painting a picture, if you like. Um, so, I, you know, I think it's probably always going to stay sort of beautiful. I like the, you know, one of the things I struggle a bit with at the moment, and, you know, and again, back to magazines is, I come from a sort of, you know, shooting on four by five and big lights and the craft of photography. You know, and I grew up using film and, you know, you had to be a good technician and you had to have the mm. craft because you couldn't retouch everything later. And there's definitely, and of course, I'm not saying that all, you know, modern photographers are bad or anything silly like that. But I think there is a de generation of photographers now who think, oh, I'll fix it in post. You know, and that was never my approach. My approach was, you know, light it beautifully and then, you know, the retouch can enhance it. But you're not, you know, you're not trying to rescue a picture through the retouch. So I suppose I still respond to the craft of it, which, you know, perhaps I'm just sort of thinking out loud here is why I'm suddenly thinking, well, go and shoot some flowers. You know, it's kind of, it feels very crafty in a way you know very sort of you know my assistants call it the the, the, the rembrandt light you know that we use on set sometimes you know, i say chiaroscuro you know that it, i think that's true that feels very sculpted and very uh very crafted and i guess i am i'm drawn to that and i'm sorry i forgot the second part of the question uh who do you think has been most influ influential to the, the to the development of your style yeah. I mean, I'd probably say Irving Penn, and it's not that I, I mean, you know, I mentioned Bailey, and obviously I'm aware of Avedon's work and, uh, you know, Annie's work when I was getting into Vanity Fair, and, you know, there's lots of, I, I didn't really have photo heroes as such, it was more pictures I was drawn to, but one thing I loved about Penn, uh, it always struck me as kind of the greatest of the great, was he could, take a beautiful photograph of anything. And I remember being absolutely gobsmacked when I saw, you know, the big platinum prints of cigarette butts. And it's almost like a joke assignment. Go and take a beautiful picture of a cigarette butt. You know, you, you kind of want to tell photo students to do that. Because, you know, of course they're not intrinsically beautiful objects. And Irving Penn would still give you an amazing picture of a cigarette butt. And I think that 
his diversity, you know, that he could take beautiful fashion pictures, take meaningful portraits, take stunning still lives. That I think is what I found very impressive. You know, that's like, that is a great photographer that can take a great picture of anything. Mm. Um, cool. So we've got a, a question here, probably, uh, we've probably just got time for a couple more final questions. One of them is from Polina, who's firstly congratulating you on a great talk. She saw your uh, talk at the Arena cinema one, uh, Seminar once. She's asking, Thank how, you. Often, how often do, these days, after such an illustrious and long career, are you coming to a shoot with not much knowledge of your model? And generally speaking, do you prefer to have preconceived ideas of what you can do with a model or now? Okay, so the answer to part one is never. I always, always, always do my research yeah. on the person. I think it's, you know, me and Mike talk about this, you know, I think, first, I think it's rude to turn up. And, not know. Um, and not know. There's a funny story. I won't say the name of the photographer, but he went to photograph the cause once for a magazine, uh, the band, the cause, they're called, if anybody doesn't know, but they, and uh, he's photographing them in, in, you know, they're three sisters who look kind of similar and very beautiful and a brother. And he said to the, the sisters, you know, you look, you know, you look great. You should form a band. You know, and it was just me. It was just so staggeringly rude and yeah. kind of, uh, so I would hope never for reasons of rudeness, but also I think, you know, you take better pictures if you know what you're dealing with or referring to or someone's, you know, baggage in the yeah. past. And so quite often, might, go on, Mike. And quite often I would ring up the person and say, can you bring something personal to you? And also when looking for locations, bring them up. Where do you like? What means something to you? Is there a cafe? Yeah, we, Is there something to your history? That on the Sarah Burton shoot. You, you know, know you find like, those... So you find those things that mean something they feel involved and that you've taken the time to be interested in them so they don't just turn up and they don't feel they anyone knows anything or cares about them you have to and if you do that it, it just always works so i'd always have a chat with the person before their public system but they bring something with them and bring a couple of clothes you like in case you hate what we're styling you with all those things you know you know know what film they've been in some of that I forget, but you know, if you if you know just a couple of things they've done recently, you can say I read that piece you were you know did or that. Oh, that's always good. Yeah, it's always good yeah. for the conversation. You get links into people, up. and once yeah, you start talking true. to them and they talk to you as equals, then you're going to get something good out of it because it is truly collaborative. If they turn up and and they feel that you're just there, sit down on that stool and we'll take a picture of you. It, nothing really good is going to happen. I think that cuts both ways as well. And Mike makes a good point there about, you know, as equals, you know, so I, you know, I have a rule. I would never, ever ask anyone for an autograph and I would never ask no, someone, never hey, can we do a picture together? Because in a way, to me, that breaks the contract as if somehow I'm a fan, you know, yeah. and they're a star and I'm a fan. And, you know, so, look, there's many people I've met and I'm very impressed with their work and it's exciting to meet them. But I don't want that dynamic of, you know, I'm in awe of them and they're up here. You know, the idea is that very much, you know, we are going to work together. We're going to do this thing together and, and, and we're equals in this moment. I think that's that's important. As for the bit about the preconceived ideas, yes, but like, you should be ready to bin them. And it's for the reason Mike said that, you know, sometimes I think you, you don't want to turn up empty handed. So you have an idea. We talk about where, what they're going to wear. And like Mike said, you know, maybe there's a sort of a personal element that they brought to it. But, you know, sometimes you try things on the day and I think you've got to be able to just go, yeah, that's not really working, you know? And so that's okay. You know, we, we don't, we don't have to do this. We're not locked into that. It was a starting point. We might get something better. I know? mean, more I and more that's... actually, I found as Berg went on, part of the reason why I was sort of started getting sick as well was I was being asked to do mood boards the whole time for shoots as though, you know, this is what it's all going to look like. Well, it used to be that I'd find a location and I'd show the location to the editor we see the clothes, you pull those things together, but there isn't a, a sort of structure of all the images going to be done. Yeah, and we both have mood getting boards, every, don't we? The other thing about mood boards is, of course, what they really do is they encourage you to copy someone else's work. Yeah, which you know, again, I hate You're always doing. saying, why am I showing you the picture you want to see? Isn't the, otherwise, why yeah. are we taking a picture? The point is we make something new. So you shouldn't have seen it before. I mean, I get the idea that there's a feeling, but I would argue in a sort of creative community we can say okay it's going to feel wintry yeah. you know, I, want I don't want to show a subject cold. a mood board with loads of someone else's pictures in there yeah it's better with the photographer and also this is not what it's going to look like so we are here to do this here's our first polaroid this is our original piece of work based on the elements we have brought together once you start bringing in a load of other work do you think this is making it sound old mike yeah no <laughs> it makes it sound real and people have integrity <laughs> <laughs> 
and wisdom. <laughs> okay. that, that's what it is. There you and go. That, Those are the words. That sounds like a perfect note to end on. Well, well said, Mike. Well said. <laughs> um, it's it's been a real pleasure listening to you both because um, I think we've learnt something more than if we'd had you both talking individually. And you've clearly got that repartee between yourself that we were talking about just before we started. Yeah, so, you. Jason, thank you so much for sharing pleasure, pictures pleasure. And your, your knowledge. And Mike, thank you again for sharing your own knowledge and also wow. um, that collaboration with, with Jason. It's clearly been a, a wonderful partnership and it, it's clearly still in place. So thank you both. And thank you to Joe McDonald, the RPS Awards Manager, Thanks, for Joe. bringing you both together. Um, it's appreciated. And thank you to our audience for staying with us this evening. It's been really great. And hope to see you all soon again. Great. Thanks, everyone. And good night. Take care. Bye-bye. Take Thanks, care. Guys. Bye then.